Hello and welcome to The Gaggle, where we challenge and, if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm Peter Lavelle, also, of course, joined by George Samueli, uh, the co-founder of The Gaggle. What we want to do here on January 1st, that for, for the both of us, it's in the afternoon, uh, late afternoon, and we did an extensive video. What we tried to do was, you know, the year ahead yesterday, but we ended up focusing most of our attention on Ukraine, which I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. So this time around on January 1st, we're going to talk about some what we think are some major events here. So I'm going to just toss them out here, George, and you can toss them back to me. OK, um, you know, the effectiveness of a, a Biden administration, considering the circumstances with the caveat, we don't know what's going to happen in Georgia. Well, the interesting thing is that the other day, um, Biden gave a, quote, major foreign policy speech, unquote. Um, it uh, generated no media attention whatsoever for a very good reason. He said nothing of any interest. Uh, beyond cliches about American leadership, restoring American leadership, restoring American trust, uh, American values, uh, you know, consulting our partners and our allies and restoring our partnerships. He had no idea as to what it was he was trying to do, which is quite an extraordinary thing. I mean, you've just been elected president, supposedly. Um, and then you think, well, what's what's your agenda? What 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 are your top three priorities that you want to? And he uh, was in the house for eight years. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, and the truth is, he has no ideas. It's a, it, it's a, I mean, it's a team that won an election uh, just simply saying they are not Trump. Um, so we, we have to assume that what they want to do is to go back to the Obama years. Um, namely, what, you know, for want of a better term, is you know, the globalism, which is uh, continuing to uh, ship uh, American jobs overseas. Uh, continuing America's kind of pointless um, commitments, uh, pointless wars, um, and just maintaining the the status quo uh, anti on, on on just about every issue. So even on on the the key question, China, what are you going to do about China? He really had nothing to say. I mean, well, let's let you know what are, what do our partners say? I don't know if you remember if they, in, during the election that Amy Klobuchar, who, was, who had this brief little flurry when all the media were very excited about her, that she would be the, you know, the, the nominee because she was a centrist and a woman and a Midwesterner and so on and so forth. And whenever a question came up uh, about Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, uh, well, I, we need to consult our partners. Uh, we need to consult our allies. I mean, that was her go-to response. I mean, I don't know anything about anything. Um, what do our partners say? So. You know, well, that, well, that's a long-winded way of saying. I, I think this is just going to be a kind of going going back to the uh, Obama years. Just restore everything and keep everything going as normal. Well, and we we found out what the electorate thought about that in November of 2016. Exactly. Exactly. One of the interesting things that's happening, I've been watching a lot of the media coverage of uh, Russia and China, particularly when Russia and China are talked about as one um, security topic. And what's really kind of interesting here is that the the official line from the foreign policy blob is the threat of Russia and China. But really what's very interesting is it, Russia and China are not really a threat whatsoever to the United States because what the United States does and what, what China and Russia do on the other side, it's very asymmetrical, okay? It, 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 it's not a one-to-one -one thing, all right? Um, which is wise on the part of the Russians and the Chinese. But what, what's interesting is that what the foreign policy establishment can't uh, accept is that a check on American hegemony. So any kind of check on hegemony is considered a security threat, which it, it, that's not a logical conclusion, okay, um, unless, you, your your um, uh, uh, end goal is regime change in Russia and regime change in China, which, you know, you can have that as a goal, um, but, you know, <laughs> getting there is going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible, because you'd cause a, a, another world war. So it seems to me that when they're formulating their ideas, when they're talking about this, it's all very asymmetrical. And that's why it's very hard to put into context 
Okay, and we had the the deputy foreign minister of here. Uh, he he basically has thrown down the gauntlet, and he's he's just said, look, I mean, you you want to talk, you know the addresses. I think that's a quote. Okay, and 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 other than that, you know, stop bothering us. Okay, I mean, because you do not want to be an interlocutor, you don't want to be a partner. Uh, we have no idea what you really want, and personally, and this I'm speaking for myself now, you really don't know what you want except for anything that challenges hegemony, which is really um, that that that's like using a um, a pair of scissors instead of a scalpel. You know what I mean, or even a hammer. So um, I think that's the kind of lack of clarity we have, um, which, which, of course, we talked about yesterday is these uh, bounty hunters. But now they're the Chinese. You know, the, after we did the video, you know what I was thinking is that that's right. We need more defense spending. And we, that's always the solution. It's always the solution. Threat inflation, defense uh, 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 spending increase. That's always it. You know, and it's like throwing everything at something at the same time and, and, and just hoping you'll get some kind of result. And that whole mindset has created a catastrophic foreign policy, particularly since the end of the Cold War. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and when you come to um, the uh, the topic of Russia, which again, strangely enough, Biden made uh, no mention of uh, during his um, uh, speech, um, they they come along and say, "Oh, well, we have to um, address uh, Russian aggression." Uh, they never really uh, formulate exactly what do they mean by Russian aggression, uh, and then they say, "Well, we you know we also need to uh, renew the New Star Treaty because there's some there's always some some you know primal uh, instinct among Democrats. You know, oh, arms control treaties are good." Um, they never really understand the role arms control treaties play in diplomacy. They're not just standalone policies. They only make any sense if they're part of a uh, general detente. Because if they're not a part of a general detente, then of course they, they will be immediately attacked by the opposition. And whoever is the next uh, president in, will say, I, we're not going to adhere to any of these uh, agreements, much as uh, Trump did with the uh, JCPOA with Iran, and much as Trump did with uh, the, uh, the Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty, and as he did with the Open Skies Treaty. So there's very little point in just simply saying, well, we will continue to wage this uh, information uh, warfare, this economic warfare against Russia, uh, we're going to continue to expand NATO. We're going to continue to uh, push our uh, forces close to Russia's borders. But we must also have a, a renew our strategic arms control. Rate. That makes no sense. Uh, and I think that that that's the sort of the, the kind of again the, the sort of mindlessness of the Biden Obama kind of mentality. And, and we can give historical context to that, is that as the, the U.S. Uh, under the Johnson administration was realizing, uh, not only was it the deadlock in Vietnam, um, but uh, victory was staring, uh, I'm sorry, defeat was staring them in, in the face. And it was in, under the Johnson administration that we got the very, very beginnings of the assault, the, the original one. And this was a way, you know, looking for a way out, okay? As it changed to administration to Nixon, again, Nixon wanted to get out with honor, right? Peace with honor, but, you know, uh, they, but essentially he had to get out of Vietnam to get out of Vietnam. He had to go to the Russians primarily and the Chinese. And then, oh, by the way, we have a segue to go away from confrontation to start working something towards our mutual benefit. And I, I just gave the historical background to exactly what you just said. You can't do it in isolation, okay? And if, if people think that, if Tony um, um, Blinken and all those uh, people think that, then they're, they're, they're uh, supremely unsuited for their jobs, okay? That's, that's because exactly. it just, this whole thing, you know, do as we say, just, just do it. I mean, it's like a child throwing a tantrum, just do it. And you have these people like James Jeffrey out there that will do anything, hook or crook, lie to everybody to get his way. This is, and people know it. That doesn't happen in a, in a vacuum, George. People understand what's going on here. Well, I think that that's exactly right. And I think that that was the whole point of the uh, the great arms control treaties of the, the 1970s and 80s, which was that they were part of a detente policy which was formulated by the U.S. leadership, it was Johnson and then Nixon, which was that it is in the American national interest to eliminate the possibility
possibilities of direct confrontations between the United States and the Soviet Union, because we don't want to get back to another Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, that was an earth, that was a sh earth shattering event yes. Uh, yes. For, for the United States, the Soviet Union, for everybody in the world. We don't want to go back to that. So therefore, it's in the interest of both parties to avoid any kind of a direct confrontation like that. Um, now, the critics of detente didn't like that because they essentially wanted to maintain uh, the Cold War uh, and so on. But it made sense from the point of view of what is the U.S. national interest. It was in the U.S. national interest to have good relations with the uh, other nuclear superpower. And part of that good relation was arms control. But if you have bad relations with Russia, if you antagonize Russia, then you're not going to get somehow some, some magic arms control treaty because there's, there's no interest in it. The Russians have no interest in it because they don't trust uh, the, the United States, that the United States will uh, stick to this policy. Um, and within the United States, there's no interest because this will immediately be seized on by, uh, by, by the en enemies of Russia, the, the Russo folks, uh, in order to bash, bash the de Democrat administration. So this, it's not going to happen. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's um, uh, it, it's very interesting. I will if they do try to pursue arms control, I wonder if there's going to be the continued insistence that um, China be part of it, um, which would be really bizarre because um, China is believed to have 200 to 300 nuclear warheads. So you want the Chinese to build up so you get parity with Russia. And China. I mean, like these people, I, I just Unless they all want to go down to uh, China's level, which I think would be great, okay? It would be great. But if you're going to do that, then you have to bring Israel in, Pakistan, India, the whole lot, okay? It should be a global... And, and you have to bring in, yeah, and you have to bring in the United Kingdom and France. I mean, the United Kingdom and France have been getting away with murder for decades because they've been allowed to just have their uh, nuclear weapons which are essentially part of NATO. I mean, this is still, it's all part of the, the same, you know, it's in the same kitchen as, as the United States, yet they're always excluded from the arms control treaties. And so, you know, <laughs> the Russians, you know, think, well, hey, how come they don't get counted as, as part of your nuclear arsenal? We know that whether to be a nuclear war, they would be, <laughs> they would be weapons on your side. Then They won't just be neutral weapons. So, yeah. You know, I mean, if you're going to bring the Chinese in, you're going to have to bring in the United Kingdom and France in. There's no such thing as a uh, neutral nuke, I'm afraid, right. here. Okay, uh, let's let's go afield here a little bit. Um, the Biden people, his orbit, keep talking about repairing relations. I wonder if that's going to continue in the insistence on um, obstructing the Nord Stream uh, project from Russia to Germany. Um, is that going to be a carryover? Because um, that's, you know, if you want to look at a policy issue, a powerful one, a real one, that's one right there, okay? Will the United States continue to demand um, that um, Europe um, conform to um, Washington's perception of energy security, which means it just blows off the Europeans? Well, I think they might, but um, from what I can gather, um, the Nord Stream uh, 2 is pretty much done. Mm -hmm. It's it's very hard to bring it to an end now. Trump tried to do it, but he failed to do it. So while the Biden people may um, uh, talk about it and, and threaten and, and holler and so on, if uh, the Germans were able to um, withstand the pressure that came from Trump, uh, I think they'll be able to withstand and uh, uh, Biden. But I do think that it, it's, it's an interesting question whether the Russians will want to sign any more such agreements with the, the Europeans. I mean, you know, they, they can't really go on have, signing these agreements and then, and then the Europeans having second thoughts uh, and so on. So you think, okay, they did this once, and I just wonder whether the Russians will ever sign another such uh, gas pipeline agreement with the Europeans again. Talking about agreement, something that's really big that has not been covered by the mainstream hardly at all, and in most cases zero, is that the European Union and China uh, agreed to a huge investment deal. Okay, again, this tells me that there, there, the Europe, the, the the European Union has to decide if it is going to be sidelined for for the rest of its uh, existence, or it's going to have to um, uh, create its own national security identity and footprint. Okay, and, um, and, and this agreement with China was very, very significant because I think it's fair to say. 
you know, I think you and I are, are painfully aware of the hyperbole about Russia, which is just it's it goes beyond nonsense. But China is a real uh, is the real deal here, okay? And if the Europeans are cutting a huge investment deal with the Chinese, and apparently um, uh, they worked very very hard to get it done by the end of the year, which means also before the next administration, okay? Because I get the sense that they just didn't pick up the call from Trump anymore. They just said you know ignore it, okay? But I don't know why. Angela Merkel wants to take a call from Joe Biden, okay, right. but for very, very different reasons here. Right. No, I think I, that, that's right. Um, it's kind of also interesting that they signed this agreement with uh, China. Um, and so the, the big confrontation with China that um, some of us were expecting earlier in the year out of resentment over um, uh, the... The, uh, the pandemic and, you know, confronting China over, well, you know, what did you know about the pandemic? When did you know it? Um, and what did you do to, um, uh, to bring it under control? We, we thought that this would be a big deal, that the, that the rest of the world was going to come to China and confront China over this issue. It doesn't look like it's going to materialize. Uh, and I think it's very strange because the Chinese are basically stonewalled. They haven't really revealed anything very much about the uh, the origins of this virus. Um, they, you know, they you know they've restricted the investigation on part of any 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 other party. And you know, we, we you know yesterday we saw you know everyone was whooping it up in Wuhan, uh, having wonderful New Year's Eve parties. You know, the rest of the world is in lockdown. <laughs> and it, you know, one would have thought this is. You know, is the rest of what really going to put up with this? You know, we're, we're here. We all are suffering uh, massive economic dislocations, and you're having a bloody New Year's Eve party. Um, you know, enjoying yourself. Uh, I, you know, I, I thought that this would be a bigger deal. Practically not. I mean, European I, I, signing I, I, agreement, and I think Biden will also be. I, I think quite it's accommodating. I, we can explain it by this that they, the Chinese have just worked very, uh, very hard, diligently, quietly, with loads of cash, and they have made inroads. I mean, they have bought off a good part of the Western elite. They really have, okay? And, you know, um, uh, what is it? Uh, the great uh, philosopher Bob Dylan said once he said that, you know, money doesn't talk, it screams. And that, that's their strategy. I mean, if you look at so many people that are so um, uh, embedded with, with different interests in China. And, and of course, you know, we only heard it was like a, 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 it was during the campaign. You know, China is no threat to us. China is not an adversary. That guy is probably going to sit in the Oval Office right. in, in, in a couple of weeks here. OK, because. I mean, from academia, from Hollywood to the media, they're all they all they were bought off. OK. And, and and you know what? I mean, objectively speaking, George, the Chinese, it had a plan and it worked. OK, because these people, you know, these talking heads, um, these people that, you know, t talk about uh, the um, uh, what is it called? Transhumanism and and the reset and all that. You know, they don't care about workers. They don't care about their own country. They care about their shareholders. They care about their stock values. And it's, it's, it's not tied in Russia. I can tell you that. OK, right. it's tied in China. OK, and China not only has been been able to make amazing inroads into Western financial institutions, it's created its own. OK, as a standby. OK, they have to, they, they've thought this thing out. Do you think the, the, the two major uh, political parties in Washington think anything out except for revenge right. on your political opponents? You know, they're, they're, their political distance is about that far away. Like, they don't have any vision, okay? They certainly don't have any vision for the country. And, and, and Joe Biden didn't tell us a damn thing about what he's going to do, still. No, that, that, that's exactly right. Um, and, and that's where you see the contrast uh, between uh, what Trump tried to do uh, in 2016 and during his years in office, which was to bring uh, the U.S.-Chinese relation under some control and to um, bring back American jobs, to make American economy um, you know, strong and independent again. Biden has no idea about that. Biden, Biden still is you know, thinking back to the good old days of the 
the um, Obama, um, Bush, Clinton years. You know, it's great. You know, in, investment in China, great, great. Ship jobs shipped overseas to China, great, wonderful. Uh, let, let's bring the Chinese into the World Trade Organization. You know, that that's that's Biden's thinking. And although at various times in the campaign he tried to um, outflank. Uh, Trump by by suggesting that Trump was selling the country out to China. You can see that you know since the end of the, the election, you know he's he's gone back to all the usual stuff with with uh, China. So yeah, I mean you'd have to say the big winner without question the big winner of 2020 has been China. And if, well, we can talk about the, the 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 global corporations and what they've done. But in terms of as a um, a, a geopolitical force. China has been the big winner. Well, it, the rest it, of the world has is still suffering from a massive uh, economic downturn. You know, China is happily, you know, <laughs> building and uh, manufacturing. So, you know, Biden is, and, and Biden is giving no indication of that he has any ideas of how he's going to address this. Well, it's really interesting because. You know, the, this uh, project warp speed to develop the vaccines here. And there was no end, you know, of, of um, a government and private, you know, Pfizer and Moderna working with the government, all that unprecedented you know, since the Manhattan Project. Well, that all may be true. I, and I'm not going to put pour cold water on it. But if you want to reverse the erosion of the industrial base and the loss of industrial jobs, and I'm going to invoke, you know, because we like uh, Soviet and Russian history. Uh, we're talking about a five-year plan, okay? But I don't, I don't see Pfizer and Moderna and the rest of them getting on board to restructure, fundamentally restructure the American American economy because they won't make any money off of it. I think that's the whole point, okay? There's no national interest at stake whatsoever, okay? When the when when um, someone um, um, I don't follow sports, you know that, but somebody in the sports world, you know, um, uh, mildly criticized China over Hong Kong, you know, and oh my goodness, you know, the NBA went running, you know, oh, the sky is falling, oh my God, you know. How can you say such a thing, you know? And then they're supporting Black Lives Matter in the United States. Right. Okay? Right. I mean, right. you know, they, they, they can't see their own hypocrisy here. But, you know, but, you know, the I, I'm really adamant about it. I mean, if, if, see, the U.S. has a massive military that it's paying off, it's pays for on a, on a credit card, okay? And, but there are limits to that eventually here. But if you have a strong industrial base, you make your own stuff, okay? I mean, I, 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 I'll have to look for it. I'll, I'll, I, I know I can find it, but like 70, 80 percent of the components that the, the Pentagon uses in its own machines and all that, it, it comes from China, OK, because it's cheaper. OK. And the economies of scale are cheaper because, you know, you know, when you when you're building uh, uh, tanks, even if you want a lot of them, I mean, it, it, those are very specific components. I mean, it's not like you could put it in a Volvo, okay? Okay, and it's expensive. It's expensive, but countries do it. China does it. Russia does it for national security reasons. The Russians are not going to be beholden to uh, uh, a Ukrainian or a German company for one of their uh, components for one of their uh, uh, anti-missile defense systems. You know, that's just stupidity. The U.S. does it, though. Okay. Right. Oh, I think well, that's exactly because, right. And that's, because and that's, they sell yeah. the contracts, you know, they make a lot of money, the revolving door, you know, you're in the Pentagon, then you're working for Raytheon. That's that model. Well, that's exactly right. And, uh, and that in terms of um, industrial policy, then you could say that is something the United States used to have. And it is something that, uh, you know, as you said, Russia has, China has, Japan has, and Germany has. I mean, the fact that Germany has uh, retained its uh, manufacturing industry edge, you know, that didn't just come about by uh, by magic. That's still, oh, you know, that all these German cars, Mercedes Benz, um, uh, Porsches and, uh, and, and the rest and all their industrial products are still reigning supreme in the world. I mean, that, that's a deliberate policy. They could have been wiped out as well by by um, uh, by the Chinese or the Japanese. They were. I mean, they were they pursued a very specific industrial policy, which you know, for instance, like as in you know, its auto industry, it was absolutely determined that it would retain its edge in the uh, in the auto industry sector, and it <laughs> can maintain its uh, its manufacturing in Germany. That's what you do. The United States hasn't done it, and and you know, and <laughs> Trump tried to address this issue. Biden hasn't. 
neither did I, nor Obama, nor Bush, nor Clinton, nor, nor any, any of the uh, people. You know, keep in yeah. mind, everyone, um, about 60 years ago, what was probably the richest city in the United States? Everyone will say New York, but no, it wasn't. Maybe San Francisco, Los Angeles. No, it was called Detroit. OK, Detroit. And now look at it now. It looks yeah. like a moonscape. OK, it was just it was ravaged in rape by uh, globalism. OK, no lessons learned. Trump tried. At least he pointed it out. OK, he pointed out this is, you know, that's our future. OK. And considering, you know, I mean, you know, I don't know, maybe Hunter will become ambassador to China and just, you know, you know, close the loop. OK, I mean, yeah, because that would make perfect sense. OK, and that would tell us everything we need to know. All right. Um, let's go further afield. Middle East, George. Uh, we go from depression to depression here. Go ahead, Middle East. Well, again, you'd have to say um, I, I don't expect any uh, changes at all. I I would think that um, it, to the extent that there will be changes, uh, they will all be to, uh, in the negative direction. I, I would think that um, they, uh, which is something we talked about before, that the Biden people will seek to uh, relaunch their regime change war in uh, Syria, um, because that that just uh, what it, they do. It enrages them that they that this is a massive failure uh, on Obama's part. Um, but of course, it will fail again because Syria, unlike uh, Libya, Syria has powerful friends, and and they will ensure that uh, the government in Damascus does not fall. I mean, it has Iran's in its corner, it has Russia in its corner. They are going to uh, fight and, for Syria. And, 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 Libya, and no one was going to fight for Libya. China, 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 China as well. China. Exactly. That's right. And, and, and that also goes for Iran, which is why Trump's um, maximum pressure campaign against Iran failed, because, again, Iran had powerful friends, Russia and China, who were willing to help out um, Iran. Um, I, 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 contrary to, uh, you know, the kind of conventional wisdom that somehow uh, Biden will return to the uh, JCPOA, I don't actually believe that. There's, there's no reason for uh, him to do that. It's just a headache for him. He's going to have problems with the powerful Israel lobby in the United States. He will have problems within his own Democratic Party from um, uh, with Chuck, Chuck Schumer, who had actually even voted against the JCPOA, even though it was Obama's um, uh, agreement. Uh, he doesn't need the headache. Uh, not to mention, of course, the Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states who, who would be against the United States re returning. So what will happen is Biden will just impose all sorts of conditions that Iran will understandably refuse to uh, meet. And that will be that. You know, there'll be no, no return to the JCPOA. So um, I, I would expect you know, things to be remain the same or deteriorate uh, further. Okay, let's let's not forget about Guaido in the in the in 2021. I mean, I I guess the curtains closed on him uh, last year. Um, I I I wonder if there's going to be a stomach for a continued uh, uh, forced regime change in Venezuela after the spectacular failure um, uh, that we had um, uh, under Pompeo and um, uh, Elliot Abrams, the the you know the the, the Darth Vader of American foreign policy. Right. I would think that they will continue to do so, but it, they're very limited options. I mean, unless they try to uh, launch some kind of a terrorist war a la the, the Contras from the 1980s, they don't have that many uh, options um, at their disposal. I mean, they've done the sanctions bit. I mean, no doubt they can tighten the sanctions. Uh, but short of launching some kind of a military operation, and drain Venezuela because they have to go on fighting um, uh, some, some this counter in, uh, insurgency war. Um, I don't see that they can succeed. They may, they, but Biden may well launch something like that. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't put it past them. Not as, as I say, not because they expect it to win, but it's like as they did with the Sandinistas. He just simply exhausted the country, just drained it of its resources, having to fight this war um, against the Contras. So that's that's a possibility. Okay, let, let's wrap it up, kind of, let's put a bow on this here. Uh, something that we've talked about before, but I think it's important to mention now since we're in the new year. Okay, you, we've gone through um, uh, 
um, um, Biden's foreign policy team. We've looked at Europe. We've looked at the Middle East. We've looked at, they looked at south of the border here. And of course, we've extensively talked about China. Um, but that kind of begs the question is that if there is going to be the ultimate Uber uh, um, um, gridlock in Washington, depending on what happens on in Georgia here, um, some of the only um, ways that Biden is going to be able to exercise power is in foreign policy. And as you well know, and people watching this podcast, there is bipartisanship in Washington only for the very worst reasons. OK, <laughs> I guess that's exactly right. If you think of what is their bipartisan policy, um, uh, regime change operation against Syria, regime change operation against Maduro. Um, belligerence toward uh, Russia. Um, so, yes, uh, that, that, uh, that there will be uh, bipartisan, um, uh, and again, hostility toward Iran. Um, so, yeah, no, there, there's no question. You know, because, you know, given that Biden is not really a particularly uh, confrontational sort of politician, I mean, that's just not in his nature. He's not a divisive sort of figure. Uh, it, it's very easy to see that you know, he'd be quite happy with, hey, let's let's build a bipartisan consensus, you know, around foreign policy. You know, he'll, he'll get Mitch to sign on to um, uh, toppling uh, uh, Maduro. He'll get Mitch to sign on with uh, toppling uh, Assad. Well, uh, they, uh, they, they, they would go along with Venezuela, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so uh, and again, you know, hostility toward Russia. You know that that's all you know, all, all good, well and good in Congress. Uh, um, China, as we've discussed, that's a different that's a case. Big... There's a lot of money splashing around when it comes to China, uh, and, and that's you know, you're not going to get bipartisanship on on taking on the Chinese. Um, so yeah, I, I can I can well given gridlock in uh, in DC. Given the likelihood the Republicans will capture the House in 2022, um, and given you know Biden's kind of um, you know non-confrontational personality, I, I, I can well see a bipartisan uh, foreign policy being forged. Yeah, yeah. Bad, bad habits die hard, don't they? Very bad habits here. Um, well, we had a depressing podcast yesterday. We equaled the depression in this podcast, but we're realists, okay? And that's how George and I look at the world. We're realists, okay? And um, and and we're populists to a great degree as well. So, all right. Uh, as usual, we're going to keep our laser light focus on events unfolding here. This is the first video uh, for the gaggle uh, in the new year. Very happy to have everyone watching us. So if you like this, please like, share, and subscribe.